UFC Nashville betting and DraftKings show. We have 12 fights this Saturday. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. And we're going to get things started in the flyweight division as UFC newcomer Asu Almabayev comes in as minus 180 favorite with the comeback on O'Day Osborne at plus 155. And this is a fun matchup in the flyweight division, one that I think we want exposure to on DraftKings because the way I see this fight playing out, on one hand, we have Almabayev who's a 17-2 prospect fighting out of Kazakhstan. He's primarily a grappler. He's got a bunch of submission victories, but his wrestling seems to look pretty decent as well. At least it's worked for him on the regional scene, and I do expect that to translate at the UFC level, especially staying on the lower to mid-tier of the division. I do think he can rattle off a couple wins here. He's not going to be fighting for the belt anytime soon, but I do think that he's overall just a solid prospect. And I think in terms of this matchup, he's going to be able to get the fight to the ground because Ode Osborne doesn't really defend takedowns all that well. And while he is going to be live early in the fight, we know he's capable of first round finishes he's had a couple of them in the UFC but also across the regional scene but outside of that he's just not really a good round winner he kind of relies on those big moments and we've seen at times when fights do get extended he kind of slows down and gasses out and we've also seen him kind of make some bonehead decisions in terms of the grappling so I do expect him to get taken down here I don't fully trust his defensive grappling once he does get tired. I could see a submission by Alma Baev or just uh, multiple takedowns, grind out that top position, that type of decision. But either way, I think he's got a pretty reasonable floor and ceiling on DraftKings at 8,600. And then on the flip side, Osborne, if he were going to pull off that victory, I think it comes in the form of an early finish. So I think you want exposure to both sides on DraftKings, but the official pick is going to be Alma Baev by submission. Next fight up in the featherweight division, we have Sean Woodson taking on Dennis Bazookian, who previously fought on Dana White's Contender Series. He actually fought twice on Contender Series, once back in 2020 against my guy Melsic Bogdasarian. He lost that fight, but gave a decent account of himself. They brought him back last season, and he did book a win, but apparently it wasn't exciting enough to where he didn't earn the contract. So he's gone back to the regional scene, put together three wins since then, and... The competition hasn't been great, but shout out to his management. They've kind of done the right thing, knowing that he's fringe UFC level, likely getting a call soon. So they didn't really take many chances in terms of who they booked him against. And he's looked good doing it. So he's currently on a six fight win streak overall. He's a pretty well-rounded guy, trains out of Sierra Longo fight team in New York with guys like Marab Dawalashwili and Aljamain Sterling, a bunch of other guys as well. So he trains at a good camp. He seems to have a lot of heart, good cardio, well-rounded guy. He's going to mix in the leg kicks and go to the wrestling. He's a solid wrestler. When he gets the fight to the ground, he's looking to do damage. So there is some things I like about Bazookian. The things I don't like is at times, you know, I, I said he does have solid cardio, but at times it seems like he hasn't really managed it properly. And aside from that, he's also very hittable in terms of his defense. Now, he has proven to be very durable, but... I don't, I don't feel comfortable when a guy's getting hit that often, especially against a good striker like Sean Woodson, who's very, very long for the division. He's very sharp with his boxing combinations, works the body well. He's got a ton of length, and he's going to use it to his advantage. Now, where Woodson kind of struggles is the defensive grappling. He's difficult to take down, but once you get him down, you can certainly outgrapple this guy, despite him making some improvements over the years. And his last time out against Luis Aldana, a lot of people expected him to roll in that spot, myself included, and he just really looked terrible, to be honest with you. He got buzzed early in the fight, got hurt multiple times, and then I don't know if it was the altitude because that fight was in Salt Lake City or what, but he did not have his normal volume. His durability was not there. Like It just seemed like maybe it was an outlier performance in terms of how bad he looked, but I don't know, man. It definitely gave me some pause here, um, and this is now his fourth opponent because the last three have had to pull out on short notice so it's a lot of things that don't really inspire a ton of confidence when you're talking about the guy who's the most expensive fighter on DraftKings at 9600 I think it's an easy fade because even if this was a layup matchup 
I don't even know if Woodson is all that deadly in terms of his finishing ability. Only three knockout victories. Yes, he's a good striker, but typically, you know, he's more than willing to fight behind that jab and just kind of pepper his opponents rather than chase a finish. And now he's going up against a guy who's super durable, who might even try to wrestle him a little bit. So I think he's a hardcore bust candidate at 9,600. I'm going to have no exposure on DraftKings. And if it burns me, so be it. And I'd actually be a little bit more interested in, in Bazooki, even though it's a small... A uh, chance that he actually were to pull off the upset. I think he's the only one I'd be targeting if targeting this fight at all. So we're going Woodson by decision. That's the official pick, but I have no interest on DraftKings. Next fight up in the flyweight division, we have Jake Hadley, a minus 200 favorite with Cody Durden on the comeback at plus 170. And this is another exciting matchup in the flyweight division. And I do have interest in terms of DraftKings because I think this one is going to score well, regardless of who wins. I do expect Cody Durden to look good early in this fight and to look like value as a sizable underdog. You know, he, he has that collegiate wrestling background. We know he's capable of getting the fight to the ground averages over three takedowns per 15 minutes and Jake Hadley is susceptible to giving up the takedowns but a big reason why is because he's so comfortable playing off his back reversing his opponents and looking for submissions off his back as well and even though I expect Durden to stay safe in top position while he's fresh I really worry in rounds two and round three because we know Cody Durden a guy who starts fast just doesn't really manage the gas tank all that well and as the fight gets extended we've seen him start to slow the the optics start to look pretty poor and he's actually been submitted multiple times in his career because of that you know he's not super defensively sound particularly once he starts to get tired and Jake Hadley is just a very aggressive fighter in those grappling exchanges and Hadley also seems to have pretty solid cardio as well so that's why I could kind of see him you know losing that first round but then potentially taking over and finding a finish later in the fight so he's going to be a possible live betting target for me I think he gets a late round finish and it comes by submission we're going Hadley by submission that's the official pick and next fight up we have Billy Quarantino, a minus 180 favor with Damon Jackson on the comeback at plus 155. And this is another one that I think is an exciting matchup, but I also just kind of worry about both sides because they're both coming off brutal knockout losses. Quarantino was knocked out by Edson Barbosa just a couple months ago. So he's making a quick turn here, whereas J- Damon Jackson was knocked out by Dan Ige just as brutally and he's coming back after about six months he was knocked out in January so it's certainly not great in terms of the durability for both guys I still kind of trust the durability of Quarantillo a bit more just because Damon Jackson we've now seen him rocked multiple times and knocked out multiple times so I do still kind of trust Billy Quarantino more in that sense I also trust his output and his work rate a little bit more he's the guy who's going to be moving forward with that pressure putting Damon Jackson on the back foot and landing in volume so if this fight does get extended I kind of just expect it to favor Billy Q here and then on the flip side Damon Jackson I think he needs to get this fight to the ground and it's not that he's a much better grappler than Quarantino. Quarantino's a BJJ black belt and certainly capable of, of grappling with Damon Jackson here. But I just think on the feet, Damon Jackson's kind of drawing a little bit thin. I think he's got to go to the wrestling, got to go to the takedowns, and that's where he has his best chance here. But I'm just not convinced he's going to be able to do that. It's it's a fight where I have concerns on both sides, but because of the output, like I mentioned, and a slight favor in terms of the durability, I'm going to go with Billy Q. No shot I'm betting on him at this price with those red flags, but I do think more than likely he gets the job done here. We're going Billy Q by TKO. That's the official pick. And next fight up in the welterweight division, we have my guy Jeremiah Wells, a minus 135 favorite with Carlston Harris on the comeback at plus 115. And this is another one where I think I like both sides on DraftKings, but I am going to side with my guy Jeremiah Wells. And I do expect Harris to be a very popular underdog here. We've seen the line kind of moving in his favor all week. So I expect a lot of those people just to take the line value and go with Harris. So maybe we'll get a little bit of an ownership discount on the Wells side. And I just, I kind of favor Wells due to the power. You know, Harris has been knocked out multiple times. I know his only loss in the UFC has come against Shavkat Rachmanov, but we have seen him chin-checked. He's been knocked out twice in his career. And in terms of the grappling, 
I'm not so convinced that Harris is going to be the better grappler, especially while these guys are fresh because Jeremiah Wells, we know he can go to the takedowns. He's got a black belt as well. And I know the cardio has kind of always been the issue with Wells. It's like, well, he's such a front runner. He's so explosive and powerful that he doesn't really have the gas tank to go 15 minutes. He kind of proved that wrong in the Semmelsberger fight where he ate some big shots early, fought through that adversity and won and took over in the later rounds and it won a decision. So he kind of proved people wrong in that sense. I don't think his cardio is as bad as people expected it to be. So I'm just not convinced that Harris is going to be able to just grapple him and big brother him for 15 minutes here. I think Wells has got the power advantage, the durability advantage, and I'm kind of treating the grappling pretty equal here with Harris being probably the better wrestler, but Wells just being the overall more physically strong fighter. So it's an interesting dynamic. I'm going to side with my Philly guy in Jeremiah Wells. I think he gets it done. We're going Wells by TKO as the official pick. And next up, we have Kyler Phillips, a minus 200 favorite with Hione Barcelos on the comeback at plus 170. And this is another one where I'm kind of treating the underdog as a live underdog, but I also just have a ton of concerns on the Barcello side. It's clear that he's starting to regress over his last couple fights. You know, his his only win over his last four fights came against Trevin Jones, who only landed 11 significant strikes. He's getting older. He's 36 years old, not young in terms of the bantamweight division and I just think Kyler Phillips is just a very athletic dude very explosive he's got that big burst especially early in fights and he's another one who comes out hot from the opening bell and sometimes tends to slow and gas out as the fight gets extended so you have to worry about that with him as a sizable favorite and that's where I think Barcello's could have a path to victory is that if Philip comes out hot and heavy, doesn't have a ton of success and doesn't get Barcelos out of there. I actually think if Phillips tries to grapple, it probably favors Barcelos because he's very strong defensive grappler. And I think it's probably just going to make Phillips gas. And that's what Barcelos needs to be able to take over. But ultimately, I just think Phillips is too explosive and Barcelos has been hurt multiple times over his last couple fights. I don't trust the chin at this stage in his career. I think Phillips hurts him on the feet and probably gets him out of there. We're going Phillips by TKO. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our featured bout on the prelims as Ignacio Bahamondes comes in as a minus 205 favorite with Lodovic Klein on the comeback at plus 175. And this is one where, similar to the Woodson fight, you know, I am pretty confident in the favorite here that Bahamondes gets the job done. But I basically have very little interest in terms of DraftKings. I think there's much better fights to target much better fighters around him in that price range to target. So this is one I'm I'm just going to look to be underweight on or have no exposure to at all depending on how many lineups I make this weekend because Bahamondes Yes, I favor him in terms of the stand-up, you know, one-dimensional striker, but a very good striker at that. And he's improved his takedown defense and defensive grappling. So even if guys try to grapple him now, I think they're going to struggle at least to get him down flat on his back. And that's not really going to be the game plan from Klein, who we've seen mix in the wrestling at times, but I wouldn't bank on him to do that. And I'm not even sure that he'd be able to have success if he tried to do that here. And I think he's just really going to struggle at range with the kicking attack of Bahamundes, who's a better boxer than him as well. I think over 15 minutes, he's going to fail to match the output. We're going Bahamundes by decision as the official pick. But again, DraftKings probably just going to fade this fight overall. And kicking off the main card, we have Tanner Boser, a minus 162 favorite with Alexa Kamor on the comeback at plus 136. And this is an interesting matchup because on one hand, we have Tanner Boser who dropped down to light heavyweight and was knocked out by Ian Kudalaba. So he's still trying to make it work in the light heavyweight division, whereas Alexa Kamor is actually coming off a two-year layoff since we last saw him against Nikolai Negramirianu, who won a split decision. And Kamor was a big favorite in that spot. I bet Nikolai, King Nikolai in that spot, so he'll always have, you know, a place in my heart for that win. But Kamor's just kind of one of the worst to do it in terms of a guy who was billed as like this solid prospect coming off contender series. And it just hasn't materialized. And I know he trains with uh, Stipe Miocic out there with a couple of those guys. Mo Miller um, is another guy in that gym as well. But he just seems like a just very vanilla guy. You know, yes, he's got a little bit of power. Most of his wins have come by knockout. 
but he's a one-dimensional striker, not going to look to grapple, can't defend takedowns. And in terms of his striking defense, that's where I have the biggest issue with him. This dude does not move his head whatsoever off the center line. So he's certainly there to be hit. He's like a punching bag. And then lastly, his cardio is not very good at all. So it just gets worse as the fight goes on. So I'm not high on K-more whatsoever. It's not that I think Boser is some sort of world beater, but I do think he is the rightful favorite here just based on being more proven at the UFC level. I think he's got more output here. I trust his cardio more. I just think the intangibles kind of favor Tanner Boser here. So I'm going with Boser by decision. But again, this is another fight where I'm expecting it to go 15 minutes and I don't really see a huge ceiling on either side. So I'm going to look to fade it on DraftKings. Boser by decision is the official pick. Which brings us to our next fight in the featherweight division as Diego Lopez comes in as a minus 162 favorite with the comeback on Gavin Tucker at plus 136. And this is another one that I do have interest on DraftKings. I think Diego Lopez is just an exciting fighting style, whether he wins or loses. I think you want to target his fights. And we kind of saw that in his UFC debut on short notice against Mavsar Evloev, one of the better prospects in the division. And he gave him just about everything that he can handle in that fight, even almost submitted him. So Diego Lopez is a dog, man. He previously fought on Contender Series, but did lose to Joe Anderson Brito. So it's not like he lost to some scrub there. Brito's done fine in the UFC, and he's another exciting prospect. And Lopez, where he struggles, is kind of at range. You know, he's not the best striker. He is going to give up takedowns, but it's because he's very comfortable in the grappling world. He's a very dangerous submission grappler. Most of his wins have come by submission. He holds a black belt, and we saw how threatening he could be on the mat against Evloev. And that's where I kind of see him having the biggest advantage in this fight against Gavin Tucker, who's coming off a long layoff. The last time we saw him, he was knocked out by Dan Ige. He's now 37 years old, so he's getting up there in age as well. So those are a lot of really red flags. Now, when he's at his best, though, Gavin Tucker's a very well-rounded fighter. He's the better striker in this matchup, and he can mix in the takedowns, although I think that would probably be a mistake here because that's where I think Lopez wants the fight to play out. But being that Lopez is more active, the younger fighter, so dangerous on the mat, and we have all of those concerns with Gavin Tucker, I'm going to go with the favorite here, Diego Lopez. I think he finds a sub. We're going Lopez by submission. That's the official pick. And up next, we have the second of two light heavyweight bouts on the card as Kennedy Zuchuku comes in as a minus 148 favorite with Dustin Jacoby on the comeback at plus 124. And here we have two good kickboxers. Dustin Jacoby comes from that high-level kickboxing background, and that's basically all he's looking to do is keep the fight standing. He's very one-dimensional. He can be taken down, but he works back to his feet very well. And he just wants to keep the fight at range so he can pepper the calves of his opponents and just kind of, you know, decision his way to a victory and hope not to get knocked out. That's mostly what he's trying to do. And he's very technically sound, so I'm not going to take that away from him. Whereas Zuchukwu is a guy who I think we have a guy who's coming into his own in terms of figuring out how to fight with his God-given ability which is his physical size. You know, he's very, very big for the division. He's going to work with a seven-inch reach advantage in this matchup. And early on in the UFC, he just seemed super gangly and kind of awkward where he didn't really know how to move, didn't know how to use that size to his advantage. I think that's getting better. And you see it in just about all of his fights. And not only is that getting better, but his overall defensive grappling is getting better. He's much harder to take down than he was previously. And I don't expect Jacoby to come in here trying to wrestle anyway, but I'm just saying this is a guy who is younger, who's making improvements from fight to fight. I've I've always kind of wanted to be higher on Zuchukwu once we started to see him start to level up from fight to fight, and that's not changing here despite him burning me in that last fight because I bet round two knockout against Devin Clark, and he pulled off his first ever career submission victory which was extra painful because I was at UFC 288 live in person rooting for him to get the finish and he ended up getting the submission as you know so I'm I'm not going to hold it against him though I still like Zuchukwu I favor him in this matchup I think Jacoby's going to struggle with closing that distance getting inside his range and I just don't think the optics of him just peppering the calf a little bit where while Zuchukwu's landing the heavier shots you know he's got nasty elbows in the clinch I think he can go to that as well so I just think 
almost all of the upside is coming on the Zuchuku side, whereas Jacoby just needs like a, a middling, close 29-28 type of decision. And I'm just never looking to back those fighters. So we're going Zuchuku. I think he gets it done by decision, but a late TKO wouldn't surprise me either. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our co-main event as Tatiana Suarez comes in as a minus 425 favorite with Jessica Andrade on the comeback at plus 300. And this is an exciting main event because you have a big name like Jessica Andrade. You have another big name like Tatiana Suarez, who's really starting to make a name for herself in the women's flyweight division. She came back against Montana De La Rosa and basically cut right through her, submitted her in the second round. And I expect her to get another scalp in this fight against Jessica Andrade, who, yes, is one of the more powerful strikers in the division. So she'll probably have a small window early to try to land something big and hurt Tatiana Suarez. But we know what's going to happen if she's unable to do that. You know, she's going to be lying flat on her back. Suarez is one of the best wrestlers across any of the female divisions. She lands over six takedowns per 15 minutes. She's got a ton of submission victories as well. And we've seen lately, Andrade really has no interest. Once she starts having to fend off submissions, you know, she's just saying, GG, let's go home. We both got paid and let's just call it a night. She's been finishing eight of her 11 losses. So I think Suarez is going to come in here, get the fight where she needs it on the mat, and basically cut right through Andrade. So we're going Suarez by submission. I think she's one of the safest plays and the overall best spend up on DraftKings at 9,500. Which brings us to our main event, and I just noticed I messed up the odds on this. If Corey Sanhagen was only a minus 148 favorite, I would be backing up the Brinks truck because I do favor him in this matchup. He's actually a minus 315 favorite and Rob Font is a plus 240 underdog, but I'm too lazy and it's late at night to go back and change it now. So we're rolling with it. And I just, I'm, I'm always a Sanhagen to guy. You guys know that if you've been listening to me for a while, he's basically my favorite fighter in the UFC, but all bias aside, I do think he's the rightful favorite because for starters, Rob Font, I, th- I think he's just starting to regress, not just in terms of his skill set, but clearly in terms of the durability. Yes, he was able to kind of prove people wrong against Adrian Yanez. That was a great first round knockout. He just outclassed him, looked great there. Durability checked out, that's fine. But the two previous fights to that against Cheeto Vera and Jose Aldo, he was dropped five times combined in those two fights. And I just, I don't like that. When you see an older guy who's been in a ton of wars, who just now is starting to get his chin checked a little bit. I just think it's it's getting close to to a cliff where he's at in terms of his durability. And you're going up against one of the best strikers in the division in Corey Sandhagen, who does have knockout power, has a ton of knockouts on his record, but he's just a high volume guy and Rob Font's going to try to match him in that. So I think it's going to be a war where both guys can eat a bunch of shots here. And I just trust Sanhagen in that war. You know, even against guys like Puter Jan, Sanhagen was coming at him all 25 minutes pressuring him. I don't think Rob Font has that in him anymore because I think if he does try to do that over 25 minutes, he's going to get hurt against a guy like Sanhagen. And I do expect that ultimately to be what happens here. We're going Sanhagen by TKO. That's the official pick. And as always, fightnumbers.com will have my DraftKings player rankings broken down by salary tier. It'll have my ownership projections as well. A couple other things. It's completely free. I'll pin it in the comments. As always, I appreciate you guys watching. Best of luck, and we'll see you next time.